Welcome to the Gospel Doctrine Helps class, where we provide you with insights, quotes, references, and help for your Gospel Doctrine class. Welcome back to another episode of Gospel Doctrine Helps class, where we look to help you with your Gospel Doctrine class. And today we are in Lesson 5 of the New Testament. It encompasses Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapters 4 and 5. And now a lot of this information is going to be familiar to you because it deals with uh, Jesus being uh, fasting for 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and then calling uh, his disciples. And so there's a lot of things that you've probably read before, and we'll go over those. And hopefully I'll have a quote or two or some scriptural references that I can send you to that'll give you some new insight on the information. Now I'm going to focus primarily in the Luke materials, Luke chapter 4 and 5. Matthew 4 and Luke 4 are very similar. There are a couple differences. I will point out one major one that I think is important. But if you've got your scriptures, let's go to uh, Luke chapter 4 and let's start. I would um, have your class read, uh, have, you know, and I've mentioned this before, have every member read a uh, a verse or of the class and just go one by one until you hit them all and you can of course stop at any time to add insight but I would read verses 1 through 13 and um, I'll read that right now um, and I'll just start with verse 1 it says and Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness and I would just stop right there and point out that uh, it is the Spirit that led him to the wilderness a lot of times we think that Satan was driving him to the wilderness it was the Spirit and I'll also bring up this fact um, this is a, a copy of a book that I have about uh, Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible um, there are several insights in the in the text that was changed in Luke chapter 4 um, matter of fact I'll just show you those real quick if you want to look at that I mean, you'll see those are the side-by-side -side comparisons. I like the book for that reason alone, is that it's got the side-to-side -side comparisons. I don't like it for, for reading um, because it's, it jumps you around, right? You, you're going back and forth. But for studying, if you're looking at a specific verse or you want some insight, it can be helpful to have that side-by-side -side comparison. So um, the lesson references those. This is here if you ever need that um, that reference or that, that information but it is the Holy Ghost um, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness and so the question that you could ask your class would be uh, are you ever led into a wilderness what is a wilderness like are, are they just talking about a physical wilderness or are they also possibly talking about a spiritual wilderness what's it like when you're in a spiritual wilderness how do you get out of a spiritual wilderness um, questions that you can ask uh, for your class. Uh, verse 2, being 40 days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended he afterward hungered. Now it doesn't say he didn't drink, in another verse it does in, uh, in, Matthew, in the Matthew account, but here it just says he, he did eat nothing. Does Luke assume that he didn't drink? I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, is it important that he didn't drink? Not sure. That's one for your class. Ask them. Being 40 days tempted of the devil. Was he tempted all 40 days? We only get record of three temptations. Was he tempted in other things that we don't have record of? I, I would say yes, absolutely. Because the scriptures teach us that he was tempted in all things like unto us. If he was tempted in all things, he knows exactly what you're tempted with and how to overcome it because he overcame all things because he descended below all things. All right, let's keep going. Uh, chapter 4, verse 3, And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command the stone that it may be made bread. Now, of course, there's two interesting insights to bring up if you haven't done so already. One is that he says, If thou be the Son of God. Remember, at this time, Christ knew exactly who he was. He's starting his ministry. He's 30 years old. He knew at 12 who he was because he was teaching the priests in the temple. He knew who he was. He had the full access of the Holy Spirit. And so the, temp the, the devil is tempting him to prove himself, right? If thou be the Son of God. In a condescending way, of course. And then, of course, he tempts him with something that is very real to him because he, is, he did take upon himself flesh and, and blood. He was here just like us, a mortal, and so he was hungry. And he tempted him to change a stone 
into bread. Now there's a an insight here that you may have considered before, may not have, but when he's talking about stones turning to bread, remember there will be a time where Christ will say to the Pharisees and to the scribes that um, that they can take stones and turn them into children of Abraham. Um, children of Abraham, right, being heirs of the celestial kingdom. And what he's also talking about is bread. Um, who is the bread of life? Well, it's Christ, right? So he's talking about perhaps those who are going to be recipients of eternal life receiving Jesus Christ. So there's maybe some un, uh, uncharted waters that you can go into there about symbolism and uh, Christ and how to inherit uh, the celestial kingdom. Verse 4, And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. <clears throat> this is interesting because does the word of God sustain us when we are fasting? And I would answer absolutely. Um, it's important to realize that you can eat bread every day of your life. You can eat food and it will keep you alive. Yet, if you don't have the word of God, how alive are you? You may be physically alive, but you're not spiritually alive. And so I think what they're, what you're getting here is some contrast between the spiritual and the physical and one that, that shouldn't be left upon you. You ought to realize that there is a spiritual aspect to yourself and we need to nourish that spirit just like we nourish our bodies. Um, when it comes to fasting, I found a quote by Joseph Smith. This is um, from the words of Joseph Smith. It's that book that was published by... Uh, Andrew E. Hatt and Lyndon Cook, BYU professors. This copy's from uh, 1985. <clears throat> there is a, a copy that you can access on the internet. I believe it's on the BYU's website. The entire book there is searchable and it's free. These are the earliest extant sources that we have of the words that Joseph Smith actually spoke. This is from a talk he gave in uh, July 30th of 1840. So this is the Nauvoo period. Um, there's some information. This was recorded in John Smith's diary. I'm just going to read a few sentences at the end. This is on page 37 of that book. It says, If the saints are sick or have sickness in their families, and the elders do not prevail, every family should get power by fasting and prayer and anointing with oil, and continue so to do, their sick shall be healed. This also is the voice of the Spirit. So um, a couple things from this quote here. He talks about fasting and how fasting and prayer and anointing with oil can heal people of sicknesses. And I want to and I want to just point out the fact that you can be spiritually sick and not physically sick and need to fast. There are people who um, have trouble feeling the Holy Spirit, not sure if they're being guided by God. They have some confusion in their minds, or perhaps even uh, they're being benighted with some doubts. The way that you overcome that is through fasting and through prayer. Prayer. If you don't fast, you can't get your body susceptible enough to the Spirit to feel the enticings of the Spirit because the flesh is too much with us. When you fast, when you voluntarily, on your own, go without food, you make your spirit more in control of your body and therefore you become more spiritually aware and better able to feel the enticings of the Holy Spirit. So that's just one method that we have, but it's a method that we're talking about, and so it ought not be lost upon us, and you, it's probably a good idea to share it to your class, that fasting puts you more in alignment with God. Now, it's not just the fasting. It's also the prayer, right? Where are your thoughts? Are they focused on your meal that you haven't gotten yet, that you're going to get in the future? Is that what they're focused on? Are they focused on um, the things of this world? Take your pick. There's so many to choose from. Or... Are they instead focused upon God and God's work? And are you trying to connect to him? Now in this instance, it also talks about anointing with oil, which we know is an ancient ritual, which is something you can do for the healing of sick. But it also talks about, also is the voice of the Spirit. We need to follow the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will guide us. Now, if you're having trouble feeling that Spirit or hearing the voice of God or receiving that pure intelligence, then you ought to spend not only some time fasting and in prayer alone, but you also ought to engage in study of the scripture. Scripture study 
prayer and fasting will bring you in connection with God more than any other thing you can do. The reason for that is because that's exactly what the Savior did and does. If you read these things, just follow the pattern. Follow the pattern. Find a scripture. And remember, quality is more important than quantity. You can read the entire Bible in a year if you read just you know, six, seven pages a day. Matter of fact, you'll read the entire Standard Works if you read just seven pages a day. But how is the quality of your connection to heaven? How is the quality of your study? Oftentimes, if you're just speed reading through it, you're going to miss a whole lot. It's better just to read one verse or one sentence and ponder it for an hour or five or days or weeks or months or years and get an answer to God from the meaning of that verse than it is to you know, read the entire standard works 20 times. Quality is much more important. It's the quality of your connection with heaven that truly matters in the end, not the quantity of study or quantity of fasting. Um, no one will ever ask you about the quantity of your fasting or the quality of your fasting. That's really between you and God. All things that really matter are between you and God, not between you and anyone else. All right, let's keep going. Verse 5 of chapter 4 of Luke. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And again, I want to reference you to the Joe Smith translation. This makes it sound like the devil has control over him and is taking him. That's not the case. It's actually in the spirit. Um, but anyway, he's up on a high mountain. And whenever you see those words, a high mountain, that ought to make you just be curious about what a mountain is. <clears throat> We've talked about this in other episodes for sure, where a mountain is a symbol of the temple, but it's also a symbol of the ascent back to God. You have to start at the bottom and climb up. When you hit the, the peak of the mountain, it is where heaven and earth meet. It's also symbolized by a triangle or... Um, yeah, a triangle pointing upward. Uh, you'll see uh, Revelation being a symbol of a triangle pointed downward, with a symbol of man reaching up to God, and the symbol of God reaching down to man. And when those two triangles are united, you see the Star of David. There are two intersecting triangles. Uh, also a symbol of, um, well, the Urim and Thummim, for example. But uh, High Mountain. Now you'll remember in First Nephi, when Nephi uh, had his first vision, I believe it's Nephi, First Nephi chapter 4, talks about being carried away into an exceedingly high mountain. Uh, Moses, in Moses chapter 1, you'll see that same language. Um, you'll see that throughout scripture because usually that means it's a, high, a place high, lifted up, symbolic of the temple. It's uh, close to the presence of God. Showed unto him all kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. So, in a moment, shows him everything. And, of course, the devil tempts him. Verse 6, the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. And that's probably not really true. I mean, Satan really doesn't. He's, he's unleashed right now. He definitely has power, but he's going to lose it all in the end. It's it's. It's just unleashed to him right now to tempt us to try so that we can learn, grow, and become like our Heavenly Father. But it's not really his to give. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. Of course, the temptation is to worship me, and you'll get this, all the things of this earth. Think about that for a moment. Worship Satan, get all the things of this earth. Let's say he was actually able to deliver all of that. What good is it at the end? Satan doesn't have anything in the next life. He will be bound, right? He's controlled by God who has higher authority, higher power. The devil is restricted in what he is able to do here. He doesn't have a body. Can he tempt us? Absolutely. Can he appear as an angel of light? Yes, he can appear as an angel of light. Can he deceive even the elect? Yes, he can. What is it that distinguishes the things of Satan from the things of God? How can you discern it? Well, if you go to Moroni, he talks about anything that teaches you to do good, that teaches you to love. That is from God, because God is love. The message, the content. Remember, there's also that element of sacrifice. While you are here on this earth, you are to sacrifice for others, to bless others. What did Christ do? He ultimately sacrificed his life. 
as you will find all true prophets are willing to sacrifice their life, and some of them do, to teach the truth, right? Think Abinadi, think Joseph Smith as some good examples. But they're not afraid to die to tell the truth because they know their state and standing before God because they've been in communion with him. When Satan comes to deceive, he will teach you things that will appeal to your carnal mind. Things that will make you grandiose and feel good about yourself and that you're so wonderful that you should be famous. And if you read the experiences of Korahor and others in the Book of Mormon, what you come to realize is that if you're being told something that's going to make you great, yeah, it's probably from Satan because the truth is none of us have anything to make us great. The only thing that I can actually say is that God is great and that you ought to follow Christ. I simply am pointing to Christ. I never would tell you to pay me money. No, no, no. I don't want your money. I would never say follow me. Don't, <laughs> you kidding? Don't follow me. Follow Christ. Follow a God who can save you. Look to Christ. Look to him and live. Don't look to me or anybody else or any other idol. No, Christ alone saves. So stay away from Satan, right? So when he says that, worship me, just don't do it. Moses, if you want to compare Moses chapter 1, after he'd been in the presence of God and Satan came to tempt him, he could distinguish because there was no divine glory. He didn't have to be transfigured to be in the presence of Satan. And you have to be transfigured to be in the, in the presence of God. Verse 8, Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Again, following the commandments, following the scriptures, Christ knew the scriptures. Get thee behind me, Satan. Now, that could be either um, like be gone, right? A, a, a request to leave. Or it could also be a request to leave because he was in a holy place, right? Um, we're not really sure, but it could have been either of those. Um, but the way Christ overcame these temptations is by, number one, giving no heed to them. And number two, using the spirit or the scriptures to combat them. He comes up with a scripture to defy Satan's request. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. That's, of course, the first commandment that you get in uh, Exodus chapter 20 of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Again, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, him only shalt thou serve. Don't serve anyone else other than God. Verse 9, and he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from thence. For it is written, he shall keep his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt thou dash thy foot against a stone. So again, the temptation is, if thou be the Son of God, throw yourself down, prove it, right? Prove who you are, right? Angels will come down and, and save you if you really are who you say you are. Good temptation, right? All right, uh, verse 12, And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed for him from a season. Um... So, of course, he overcame again. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, another verse of scripture. And um, this is interesting in verse 13. It says, the devil had ended, when the devil had ended all the temptation. Was this all the temptation he was going to have? Was those three? Well, again, I, I don't think that's correct because he was tempted in all things. Were there other temptations later? Maybe. I'm not sure. Does it matter? Probably not. But this is a point in time where you ought to go to Matthew 4, verse 11. If, you, if you're following along, this is a differentiation, but it's one it's important to point out because, well, it gives us some insight uh, and some information that we need. This is Matthew chapter 4, verse 11. It says, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. This is important because once... Once Satan's gone, the angels show up and minister him. And what are the angels doing? Well, this is where Christ received a dispensation of the gospel, as all who had before him, and in the same manner as all who had gone before him, all prophets, right? Uh, references for you to look at, uh, Matthew 17, 1 through 3, that's carried up, um, Abraham uh, 2, 8 through 12, Moses 1, 3 through 4, 
Those are just some cross-references to look at when angels come and minister uh, to those receiving a dispensation of the gospel. Okay, let's keep going. Back to Luke. Uh, I would read verses 14 and 15. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Now, I bring up these two verses, and I don't think you should skip them because they teach us something. Number one, there's no mention in here about any miracles that Jesus had performed at this time. Yet it's telling us, Luke is telling us, that he returned in the power of the Spirit. Oftentimes it's easy to point to and look at all of the miracles that Christ performed. They're, they're in abundance. The, the lepers he healed. The, 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 all of the examples. The woman with the issue of blood. The blind who could then see. I mean, there's so many examples. But what we sometimes miss is the fact that he taught in their synagogues. Verse 15. He taught in their synagogues. And we'll see that in other places throughout Scripture. But what was he teaching? Why was he teaching? He taught many times. Some in synagogues, sometimes without. He was a preacher of righteousness. He was teaching people how to connect to the Spirit. How to connect to God. He was teaching them to be righteous. To live lives of righteousness he was teaching them in the power of the spirit and there went out a fame about him throughout the region round about because of the words that he uttered which were eternal words he was teaching them in a way that the scribes and the pharisees were not teaching remember they were teaching more about the letter of the law and he obviously had the spirit of the law. And I think it's important to bring out these things in your teaching that he taught in the synagogues. He taught. And we too ought to be like Christ and teach the truth. All right. The next scriptures that I would have you read in your class would be 16 through 19 and then 20 through 25. Even though, it, you know, you could go 20 to, to 32. I would do 20 to 25, talk about them. And then I would go 26 to 32, and then 33 through 37, and then 38 through 40, and then 40 through 44. That's how I break this up. Um, and we'll try and hit some, I'm just going to give you some scriptural references here, otherwise it'll go on for hours. Um, if you look at verse 18, <clears throat> the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is him preaching. He'd gone to Nazareth where he grew up. We, He grew up there for about, you know, He's about 30 years old, so probably at least 20 plus years he'd lived in Nazareth. He went there, um, he was delivered, he got the book of Esaias, which is the book of Isaiah, that's verse 17. He read for, uh, from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Um, if you're looking at those verses, what is the acceptable year of the Lord? Well, he's referring to a jubilee. That's Leviticus 25, 8 through 17. You can read that in your class. What is Jesus' role in a jubilee? Well, in this jubilee, he is there to preach deliverance to the captives, give sight to the blind, set liberty to them who are bruised. Who, who is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the people he's actually teaching because he will liberate them. But he's also talking about those who have gone on before, those who have died. Um, there's a great passage in uh, Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith. <clears throat> it's too long for me to read the whole thing. But it's on page 218 to 219, uh, Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, where he talks about the destiny of man is irretrievably fixed at his death and that he is made either eternally happily, happy or eternally miserable. And if a man dies without a knowledge of God, he must be eternally damned, without any mitigation of his punishment, alleviation of his pain, or most latent hope of deliverance while ages, endless ages shall roll along. 
However orthodox this principle may be, we shall find that it is at variance with the testimony of the Holy Writ. For our Savior says that all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven, men wherewith they shall blaspheme. But blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven, neither in this world nor in the world to come, evidently showing that there are sins which may be forgiven in the world to come, although the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost cannot be forgiven. And then he talks about how here then we have the account of our Savior preaching to the spirits in prison. This is 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. And then he says, uh, why would he preach to them that are in prison, that they were to stay there? Certainly not. Let his own declaration testify. And he quotes Luke 4, 18. Isaiah has said it. And it is very evident from this, he not only went to preach to them, but to deliver them or bring them out of the prison house. Talking about those who are dead or who will die without knowledge of the gospel that Christ went to set them free as well. Again, multiple meanings of scripture we're talking about. He's teaching not only them this information because he will save them, but also those who have passed on and who would pass on in the future without a knowledge. Um, verse 18, I want to bring up the fact that he says, the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord upon me. Again, a reference to having the Spirit after having fasted. And it talked about in uh, verse 14 that he returned in the power of the Spirit. So he's got the power of the Spirit. And he says that he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Who are the poor? It's a great question. Is this Christ's mission that he's outlining? Um, that he's here to preach the gospel. Uh, what does it mean to be anointed? Who are the anointed? Is Christ the only anointed? And I'll remind you that the word Messiah means anointed one. Who anointed him? Where's the record of that? Is the record of that in heaven? Um, some other references for uh, verse 18, if you want to cross-reference Psalms 79, 11, Psalms 126, 1, Isaiah 42, verse 7, and DNC 138, 31 are all great cross-references for that verse. Um, and then, of course, verse 20, after he read this, he closed the book, gave it to the, to the minister, they put the book back, remember? And it's not actually a book, it's a scroll. If you've ever seen the scrolls, remember Jesus was Jewish. The Old Testament were put on two scrolls. They were stitched together. Uh, they were on a type of papyrus or paper, and they were handwritten. Um, and you scroll, go. remember uh, Hebrews, it reads right to left. And so they would unscroll it this way to read it. They would put the scrolls together and put them back. Uh, the minister, the person in charge of that synagogue would take them, return them. Uh, Jesus would stand and read them anytime scriptures were read. You would stand, he would stand, he would uh, read it, and then they were returned. All right, and then it says, verse 20, And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fasted upon him. He read the scripture, and it was put away. They looked at him, verse 21, He began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. That was Christ's commentary on what he read. This scripture is being fulfilled in your very ears today by Christ. Think about the power of what he just said. At verse 22, all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Think about how Luke, although he tells us about the miracles of Christ, how Luke right here is telling us about how Christ's preaching affected the people. All bear him witness. They all bore witness that what he said was true. That the scripture was fulfilled in their very ears. And the words of Isaiah the prophet had come to pass. And they wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. They caused them awe amazement and wonder. The gospel in your life ought to cause you wonderment and amazement at what God has done for you and the words that he's left you in scripture and the words that he speaks to you in your mind as you follow that pure spirit of intelligence which is the Holy Ghost. And then, of course, some people said, is not this Joseph's son? Wait a minute. I Even though I feel the spirit, I know you. I know you when you were a kid, and you should look at um, 
John 14.10 and Romans 8.4 to cross-reference this verse. And then, of course, 23, they said unto him, You will surely say, or this is Christ speaking unto them, You will surely say unto me, This proverb, Physician, heal thyself whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. The people absolutely knew that there was some problem here because they felt the Spirit, yet they knew Jesus. They knew who he was. Um, is not this Joseph's son? Verse 22. Look also at uh, John 14.10 and Romans 8.4, which are other good cross-references. Um, and of course, you know, verse 23, Christ said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. In other words, his fame had gone abroad. It was noised abroad. They knew who he was, that he had been healing others. Verse 24, And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But, verse 25, I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heavens was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. Many lepers were in Israel at the time of Elias the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they had heard these things, were filled with wrath. And they rose up, verse 29, and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the bro of the hill whereupon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. Think about how they had felt the spirit one moment. They were in wonder, awe, and amazement. And then he tells them truth, and they get mad at him. How often when we hear truth, the words of God, God speaking to us, does it anger us because we want things our way or whatever. So they tried to cast him down headlong. Look also uh, some references, Deuteronomy 13.5. 2 Nephi 10.3, when you have a moment. But, this is verse 30, He, passing through the midst of them, went his way. Christ has the ability to simply walk through a crowd, an angry crowd, when they're trying to cast him off a hill and kill him. And he has the ability to miraculously just walk through. His time had not yet come. He had not performed the atonement. He, the signs had not yet happened. He hadn't finished his work, and so he simply passed through them using his magical power, even the power of God. Helaman 10.16 is another reference for passing through the midst of them and going on your way. And came down into Capernaum, city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was filled with power. Again, another reference. The words of Christ have power. And we have the words of Christ preserved for us. How often do we study them? How often do we memorize them? How often do we repeat them? How often do we let them into, into, enter into our hearts and into our minds? Well, there's a few other scripture references um, that, that you should look at. Uh, 1 Kings 17, 8 through 16, 2 Kings 5, 1 through 15. Those are the stories that Christ referenced uh, were the lepers and Naaman the Syrian, and also Elias, uh, the woman who was a widow that, that God took care of. Um, so those are references if you want to go to those. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple other references that you can use in the rest of Luke chapter 4. Uh, if you want to read about Jesus' brothers, um, it's a reference for Matthew, th or sorry, verse 32. Matthew 13, 54 through 56, it says Jesus went into Capernaum. Look also at Mark Chapter 3, 70 through 78, great multitudes were already following Jesus at this time. Um, Matthew 9, 36 through 38, uh, it's when John sends more disciples to Jesus. Um, look at Matthew 11, 1 through 6, and Luke 7, 18 through 23. Um, and then, of course, we've got, um, you know, more miracles of Christ. I'm going to jump over to chapter 5, verse 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gesenaret. What does it mean when the people pressed upon him? That's something to ask your class. What does it mean to be pressed upon? Is it crowded around him? 
Is this um, imagery used to show you that he was walking around and people were crowding around him? Well, verse 2, And saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. Um, I'll point out one of the Joseph Smith translation changes. Instead of washing their nets, uh, he changed it to wetting their nets. Why do you think, why do you think Joseph Smith did that? That's a question. What's the difference between washing and wetting? Why differentiate it? Why change it? Um, is washing typically identified with a holy ordinance or several holy ordinances such as baptism or other types of washing? Anyway, something to consider. Um, verse 4, Now when they left speaking, he said to Solomon, Lodge out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. This is interesting because we have Simon Peter here and he's being told by Christ who is a carpenter to launch out, cast your nets to get some fish. How would you feel if you were a fisherman and a carpenter told you how to fish? That's an interesting question you ought to ask your class. Maybe even relate it now to uh, a surgeon being told by a banker how to do surgery, right? How would that work? Anyway, what was Peter's response, right? And he did as he was told, right? He said, verse 5, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. What can we learn from Simon Peter at this point? He was humble. And humility ought to be something you talk about in your lesson if you talk about that verse. And verse 6, when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. Um, is this a good thing or a bad thing to get so many fishes that your net breaks? What is the moral of this story? Verse 7, and they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the, in the other ship, that they would come and help them. And as they came, they filled both the ships so that they began to sink. So you got broken nets and you got ships sinking because of so much bounteous uh, fish that you've received. What's the moral of the story? If you're humble and you follow Christ, he will bless you in abundance. You'll see this same thing being shown in Luke 6, 36, or sorry, Luke, thir Luke 6, 38, where it says, Give and it shall be given unto you good measure pressed down and shaken together and running over shall man give into your bosom. Think about those words of Christ. He's actually showing them before he's teaching them the words that whatever you give, you'll get back in abundance. And here, Christ is giving them in abundance. Whenever you're humble and follow the Lord, you'll be blessed. There's a lot more here. But we've well gone over our time, and I hope that these things have been helpful to you in teaching your lesson, and we wish you all the luck. If you've enjoyed this, give it a thumbs up. If you have questions, comments, you think I've got something wrong or got something right, leave me a comment in the section below. Look forward to hearing from you and your feedback. Thanks for watching.